A funny story. Earlier today, I had a chance to um, do an interview down in Warren, Pennsylvania, with uh, a person, or is it, if you're baseball fans, who was the uh, World Series seventh game pitcher for 1971 Pittsburgh Pirates, Steve Blass. And it was, it was just fun, as this will be in a few minutes. But as I was walking in today, I saw uh, Steve Whitaker, and immediately picked up the file. And so as I'm preparing, sitting up there, and I'm looking at this stuff, hmm, 1971, seventh game, Steve Blass, where is Joe Girassi? I don't have any of my notes, so I, <laughs> our, our, it could have been a most interesting interview here. <laughs> we did do an interview uh, in 2000, uh, before there was a Jackson Center, and I was doing interviews with various members of the Bar Association who were either at the funeral of Robert Jackson or at the cemetery for Robert Jackson, and you were at the latter. And so I, look, I watched that interview uh, just yesterday, uh, which you were, by the way, just, uh, I'm gonna say, I will stop talking and he will be talk, doing the talking here. But as I, if you've ever had to go up to Mayville, they just had secured the uh, uh, security system there, and I had my camera bag, and as I was trying, try to walk in to see a Justice of the New York Supreme Court with a camera bag that looks like you're carrying a gun and everything else humanly possible. It took me a long time to get to see you, and I thought my name would get me somewhere, and it didn't. I just kept <laughs> dropping. I'm going to see Joe Jirasi. Well, it was because of your name that you got held up. <laughs> <laughs> Is that another Swedish story? <laughs> Tim, where are we going with this? I do it all. We did have a chance also, uh, and I want you to comment on the influences of your life. We did an interview with your uncle, Alan, uh, Judge Alimo. Um, what, what did he mean to you? Well, he, you know, many of us uh, uh, have uh, uh, someone we especially admire, and uh, he was one that I did. I, I, I liked his example. Uh, I didn't like his, some of his politics, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, I like the example uh, that he had and the uh, dedication with which he uh, carried out his law practice and eventually his judgeship. And uh, I really couldn't say anything negative about him. And I, I truly uh, miss him because I looked to him, too, uh, during my time as a judge. Uh, I looked to him for some uh, guidance in cases that uh, were very complicated and that I knew maybe had some federal implications uh, as well as state. But he was a, an easy example to follow. He was a top-notch individual. Actually, one of the evenings we had here with honoring him was one of the great highlights of the Jackson Center and I know uh, of the family and uh, it was really incredible what you did there. Um, you Grew up in in you know Lakewood Lakewood High School, practiced law hometown for twenty some years, but I looking at your bio, something I didn't know anything about was the fact that during World War II you were or after World War II you were assigned to the USS Haven and participated in the atomic bomb tests at, at Bikini Island, um, or was it just bomb test looking at bikinis? I'm not sure what that said here. <laughs> I, a little vague. Anyways, tell me a talk about that, because I had no clue you were part of that. Well, I, I was uh, uh, stationed in the States, and I said, uh, look, I, uh, I didn't join the Navy to uh, be in an office job, and so I, I volunteered for overseas duty. Um, in the meantime, uh, you know, the war uh, came to an end without my... Uh, conquering the Japanese all by myself. Eventually, when uh, the atomic uh, bomb had been uh, tested, they did want to test it out in the ocean. And so I got assigned there. Uh, I was assigned to that hospital ship you mentioned, the uh, USS uh, Haven, and uh, had an opportunity to s witness that uh, bombing of the ships that we had out in Bikini. They were different old ships and uh, they had uh, put a lot of animals aboard those ships 
Uh, I don't know if my wife would have approved uh, of that, but uh, they had animals on them in the order to determine what effect that the uh, uh, radiation would have on living uh, animals. And uh, so the day of the test, uh, I remember uh, distinctly they uh, provided us uh, with uh, uh, glasses that actually you couldn't see through until the bomb exploded. Then it was like uh, daylight and you could see the mushroom that all of you have seen on, uh, on television. And uh, uh, I was within five miles of that, uh, our ship was, and I could just feel the heat as though I had opened the, uh, the door to the uh, furnace, the uh, coal furnace that we had at home years ago. Uh, many of the uh, uh, men, I don't recall any women nurses there or women at all, but uh, many of the men did develop cancer later on, testicular cancer. And uh, so I held my breath for a few years and escaped that particular uh, experience. But uh, it was as close as I came to uh, uh, any type of warfare, if you will. We, we recently, we do a project here at the Jackson Center where we've been interviewing uh, folks who were part of the World War II experience. Um, and last Saturday we interviewed a person who was on shore patrol in, the, in Tokyo Bay and he was at there are five days after Nagasaki was bombed. Um, and it was just riveting his description of that. Uh, what's your description of it? I mean, as you saw, as part of your service, the atomic bomb, you saw the mushroom, you saw the, you felt the heat, you saw the ash. What's your sense of all this from a, a strategic military perspective? Well, uh, knowing that a uh, similar bomb was dropped uh, on Nagasaki, and I think Nagasaki was not the original target. No. Again, I'd rely on, uh, on my historian, or you. But uh, um, knowing uh, of that, uh, I knew what the potential, the potency of that atomic bomb was. Um, I had mixed emotions about whether or, or not uh, we should have dropped it on those innocent, uh, I call them innocent, Japanese citizens, uh, but uh, President uh, Truman felt, as you know, that uh, if the war extended, there would be a lot more, many more American soldiers, uh, uh, men and women, uh, that would become victims of the war, fatalities. And he felt that uh, something was needed to bring that war to an end because the enemy literally were fanatics, many of them. and. Uh, you know about the uh, dive bombers and many of those who uh, literally committed their lives and death to accomplish their goal of trying to win the war. So taking that all into account, uh, I couldn't help but be uh, literally s speechless and overcome by the impact of that bomb. You studied Robert Jackson, and he was the chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial, which was really the bookend of World War II. What's your sense? You both went to Albany Law School. Uh, you graduated, and he didn't, and both became judges and justices. What's your sense of Robert Jackson as you sit here in the Robert Jackson Center? Well, he, he's another uh, uh, of my heroes as it were. Uh, there are times I wish I had the ability to clone uh, people, and I'd love to have cloned him and had uh, nine of him on the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, he, he really was a model judge. Uh, he uh, didn't, any of his decisions uh, were not based on politics. Uh, they were based on what he thought was right. And even if the case uh, that he would decide would be against what the American government stood for, the American president stood for, uh, he would make what he thought was a proper decision. And to be honest with you, 
I, I've read many, many of his decisions, and I don't um, I recall any with which I would disagree. And uh, when I was uh, sitting as a, a judge in uh, uh, Mayville, uh, I had asked Henry Weiler, who's here tonight, uh, to do some research on all the cases that he could find that were filed in Mayville uh, that were conducted by uh, Justice Jackson. And we compiled all those decisions. And then uh, I saw to it that uh, the appellate decisions in which he had a part uh, were included in, uh, in this book that uh, Henry Weiler put together for me and which I loaned to Helen Ebersall and uh, she uh, used uh, at that time to uh, write, to do her uh, writing. But in the course of uh, studying those decisions, one that struck me particularly uh, was a decision that he made as a lawyer to represent a farmer out in the town of Carroll uh, who was a dairy farmer. He had sold milk to people in Jamestown. And uh, uh, a disease that broke out in, uh, in the city and the uh, health department attributed it to milk that was from the uh, farm, the Forbes farm. And uh, as a result, they had to shut down his business. Well, what they learned was that uh, at that time, Jamestown didn't have a sewer. And they had the greatest septic tank, this side of Mayville, uh, that emptied into the river that the cattle at this farm uh, would drink uh, water, or the water from. And as a result, the, uh, they can, they of course, pass those germs on through the milk. And so he had the courage, he, Jackson, uh, to uh, represent this farmer, to sue the city of Jamestown for damages. And uh, he tried the case. He won. Uh, the appellate division reversed it. And he didn't give up. He tried it again and won more money the second time than he did the first. Uh, and so I call him the original environmentalist in, of Chautauqua County because he uh, fought that case, fought it hard, and uh, he won it. I also was impressed, as you know, with the fact that even before he had that uh, license to practice law. He was given permission to represent some uh, uh, workers uh, who were uh, criminally charged for having created uh, damage to the uh, uh, implements of their employer. And uh, he successfully represented them. Um, by the way, does that book still exist? That's a question. <laughs> oh, it's still around. I don't and Henry's know. holding out on you? I think it's here. No. Here. Is it here? I thought I brought it here. Oh, okay. It's a whole collection of papers. Okay, all right. It's around somewhere. Good, good, good. Between good. you and Helen Eversole. <laughs> and maybe in a cardboard box. Look for a cardboard box. Okay, up we'll bring Henry. Come on floor. down. You can help us look for it. Yeah. Probably it. So your, your grandchildren come up to you someday, and uh, they say, we just came through Mayville, New York, and we saw a building that's named after Joseph Jirasi. And they ask you the question, why? What would you say to that? <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask Bob Barber. I, I, uh, as you know, the governor tapped me to be a commissioner of agriculture, so I, I had to leave the area. And uh, Bob uh, thought it might be a good idea to name the building after me. Uh, I did hear that uh, one of the members of the Board of Supervisors uh, was really unhappy because of the precedent. He said, we don't name buildings unless the individual is dead. Well, he happened to be of the opposite political party, so I wasn't sure <laughs> really what he was saying. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I, it was probably, uh, uh, you have to ask Bob. Well, it's a tremendous honor. I mean, think about it as you reflect back, and, and you, you're such a modest guy. 
but from your private practice, from being the first county executive to the supervisory roles that you, you won. You won a lot more than you lost, and as you're talking about voting. And uh, your roles in the state government, appointed as a justice, uh, judge of the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and even today, and most people don't know this, but he's such an impact guy that the whole concept of summary jury trials is your idea. In fact, it's been written up on uh, United States United Court System as the retired 8th District Supreme Court Justice Joseph Drossi, who is a member of the UCS Jury Trial Project and now serves as a judicial hearing officer, is leading the effort to making the summary jury trials a way of life in New York State. The 8th District pioneered the use of the summary jury trials in New York eight years ago, beginning with Judge Tarasi's Chautauqua County project. And it, it's gone on to become really the model for the state. That's your idea. Well, I, I have to thank uh, Kathy Krause uh, because uh, she, as a clerk of the court, uh, and she was also a jury commissioner, uh, and she was sympathetic with the idea of having jury trials of cases uh, that normally would take a week or two weeks or three weeks or even a month to try and to have them tried in a day or two uh, through this method that we uh, developed. Um, she believed in that. But if she didn't, it would have been very difficult for that program to get off the ground. So uh, I, I get all the credit, but she should get... Uh, at least 51%, because without her okay, uh, I would have had a difficult time uh, getting that in process. And uh, w what I find is uh, there was or is uh, Judge Suarez that's been appointed as administrator of that uh, summary jury trial program statewide. And uh, uh, thousands of cases have been tried in, in the one day uh, procedure and it just saved the lawyers saved the parties uh, the litigants a tremendous amounts of money to get their issues heard and what we learned was because i i did uh, uh, try uh, some cases on a non-binding basis where jurors did not know that uh, the issues would be decided by them uh, but be non-binding. And uh, in those cases, if the loser didn't like the decision, the loser could ask for a formal uh, full-scale trial. And uh, uh, six appeals were taken from those, uh, or d rather decisions were made by the losers of some non-binding trials. And... Uh, uh, those in those cases, uh, I think it was all but one. The same parties won in the extended trial that won in the one-day trial, which proved to me that those one-day trials do reflect what a jury would decide in an extended case. You were on the other side of the bench, trying cases. Give us your best war story. As a, as a, when you tried matters, you defended matters, something you'd say, hmm, you know, it's something you guys, you know, as we get around at the Bar Association meetings, you know, guys start talking about stories. Share one with them that you can actually oh, share. Oh, I should have. I should have picked up that article uh, called uh, The War Stories. Uh, a reporter for the Law Journal contacted me and uh, wanted to have a few of my war stories and unfortunately uh, because I wore my brain out on the talk tonight <laughs> I can uh, I can only remember at, at the moment uh, one I remember trying it in front of uh, Judge George Shiverton who was a justice of the peace of the town of, of Busti and uh, it was back in my early days when uh, uh, I, I would take speeding cases and the like. And when young people could afford to pay a lawyer on a speeding case. And in, in that case, uh, uh, I represented a, a, a man who had this beat up truck. 
and uh, he was uh, charged uh, with speeding 50 miles an hour uh, in a 45 mile uh, zone. And uh, uh, he convinced me. He said, my truck won't go 50 miles an hour. It's an old, it hasn't. It's never gone that. And so uh, the judge said, well, tell you what we're going to do. Because he was kind of convinced that maybe the man had a point. I'm going to ride in that truck. Well, there was only one seat, and that was a driver's seat. There was a wooden uh, uh, bench, and the judge sat on that and uh, right next to the uh, driver. And the driver uh, got in the truck. We went on to the road, and he pushed the accelerator down, and that truck went up to 40, 45, 40, 45, 46, 45, 46. And I thought, man, we got this case won. Well, the judge then... Um, took the uh, stick, and it's the shift, it was a floor shift, and he, and he pulled it back. And sure enough, the car lurched ahead 46, 47, 52 miles an hour. <laughs> and I lost the case. <laughs> <laughs> One other one, though, I've got to tell you about that I recall involved uh, Judge Cass's father. He was a bulldog of a trial lawyer. Just incredible. And uh, I had a case, uh, uh, or I was retained. Uh, Ernest Leet couldn't uh, handle the case for some reason or other, and he referred it to me. And it was a case where uh, a, uh, a farmer had uh, uh, wanted to burn some logs and the like, and uh, they uh, uh, those that fire. Uh, actually spread to the land of the adjoining uh, owner and uh, burned some trees there and destroyed some property there. And so he sued the uh, landowner that had started the fire. And Willard uh, uh, represented uh, uh, that individual. And uh, I thought, geez, I got it. I have a case that is just a winner, no doubt about it. I felt very confident. And so my client got on the stand and he told the story. Fire started on the other side of the property and wasn't managed very well and uh, came over to his property and destroyed his valuable trees and part of his orchard. And uh, so I thought, well, we've got this one. So doesn't uh, Willard get up and uh, say, well, now, let's see. Uh, you own uh, this uh, uh, Model A Ford, uh, don't you? Yeah. I see. Well, weren't you convicted of dragging your dog that was tied to the rear of that truck, of dragging that dog down the road until it died? My case went right out the window. <laughs> I wish I could remember a case I won. <laughs> <laughs> Those aren't as much fun to talk about. <laughs> but you're a winner under every, every instance that we've had. I mean, just your career from not only the commitment you've made to Chautauqua County, the commitment you've made to the rule of law, the institution of things that heretofore had not been done, uh, what you've done with the eggs markets, what you've done with the, the county, what you've done, and it's been uh, received so well in our area through the awards you've won, and yet you humbly always deflect that. You just humbly are shy about saying, it's not me, it's other people. That's the way you are. That's the way you grew up. And uh, I, for one, just want to pause and don't be shy and accept our applause for being Joe Jirasi. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.